Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, meeting of the uh, Board of Governors Task Force on Facilities Funding, and I appreciate all the hard work that everyone has done. Uh, one way or another, we've all rolled up our shirt sleeves and uh, tried to find a solution to uh, uh, this terrible situation that we find ourselves in with no PICO. Chris, I think the announcement is that there is zero. Yes, I believe tomorrow the Facilities Committee will, of course, meet, and we have not yet received a PICO allocation from the Commissioner, and so, therefore, I believe the Committee is going to move, a, you know, no PICO budget tomorrow, because we don't have an allocation. Oh, Lord. But that's based on, you know, um, the estimates that were provided. Right. And I, uh, I want to say that can work in our favor. So, now, Michelle, would you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Barber. Here. Ms. Batchelor? Here. Dr. Bradley? Mr. Cole? Here. Mr. Donati? Here. Mr. Fajak? Here. Mr. Long? Here. Uh, sorry, John Long? <laughs> Here. Michael Long? Here. Uh, Ms. Owen? Here. Dr. Robinson? Dr. Rosenberg? Here. Uh, Madam Chair, you have four. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, since our last meeting in June, I know we've all been very busy. Uh, first, I would like uh, uh, the, the task force to know that I have been um, uh, on the road and actively explaining the work of the task force uh, to uh, uh, primarily uh, legislative related folks. Welcome, President Robinson. And, uh, uh, and uh, there is a growing recognition of the challenges that we face as a system uh, in the facilities area. Uh, the people that I have met with uh, uh, are, include Senator Gates, uh, Adam Hollingsworth, the governor's new uh, chief of staff, um, Dale Brill, and Ben Watkins. Uh, I also plan to meet on Friday with Speaker-designate uh, Weatherford uh, and uh, to discuss our issues with them. Uh, I will tell you that these important leaders understand uh, that the task force and the advisory group are very capable, and I believe that the recommendations of the task force will be given great weight, not only by the Board of Governors, but key policy makers. It's too early to say uh, what this may mean, but it certainly is encouraging, and important policy makers are willing to take the time to listen. One important uh, aspect of the meeting uh, last week was that uh, uh, the governor's chief of staff, Adams Hollingsworth, has uh, we talked to him about the, what is the governor's um, a sense of state debt. And he said the governor didn't have a policy on state debt, that they were meeting on October the 2nd and they were going to establish it. And uh, he would let us know on October the 3rd. That is a key uh, point in uh, where we go and how we go, uh, but he understood that that was an important problem, an important issue for the governor of our state to decide on. And uh, so, uh, Chris, would you give us a report on what else has come up this summer? Um, thank you, President Benz. I'd be very glad to do that. I'd also like to let you know first, I believe um, several of our advisors are participating via teleconference. And I don't know if they'll be able to just listen in or. We need to take a couple of minutes and get the conference phone set up. So we have uh, two minutes for you. He wants to take a two minute break, two minute break. with your with your permission, ma'am. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Let's let's uh, let the folks dial in, as they say. OK. This is Judy Benz. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, to it, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, be, uh, attend the uh, uh, the meeting by uh, uh, conference call. Uh, all I've done is I've just given a brief overview of what I've been doing this summer and the meetings I've had, and that we were welcomed. That there is an absolute state of urgency that is pushing uh, us along, shall I say, and our issue along. And Chris was just getting into uh, what uh, other activities have occurred this summer. Yeah. Thank you again, President Betts, and thank you for those joining us on the teleconference. I will let everyone know that the meeting materials are posted on the board's website. You can find them several ways. I think the easiest way is look under um, the facilities task force for the September 12th meeting, 
and you should find all the meeting materials there. Uh, if not, please contact me after the meeting. I'll be glad to get, get, get those for you. Um, second, yes, we've had quite a lot of activity over the summer. Our last meeting, of course, was in connection with the June Board of Governors meeting. The advisors have been very active, sending me a lot of great ideas based on the conversations that we've had. We've had at least three or four teleconferences of, um, to address the different charges. The task force members have been very active. I know I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with many of the task force members. And um, I think there's been a lot, of, a lot that's in this draft report is you know, a result of those conversations. And I'll also let the members know, I know Dr. Bentz directed me in June to write a dissertation, <laughs> and I think I did write a lot of pages of material. I don't know if it's, you know, doctoral quality, but she, of course, like, you know, said, well, this, you wrote, you, you take all that out. You need to, <laughs> so I, I, I don't, you know, I'm like, oh, good. I'm glad I never worked on my PhD, because it was, um, it's anyway, painful. it's painful. <laughs> so we've taken this, what, what's in your package is an abbreviated version. There's a lot more behind it but there's a lot more of the conclusions. So when we get to the part we talk about the recommendations, I think the task force and advisors understand, but I want others who may be listening to understand, these recommendations don't just fall out of the air as it appears to in the report. There's a lot of good work and good detail behind all the recommendations, and we'll discuss that later. But we, for the sake of brevity and to keep the meet meeting moving forward today, we just boiled it down to the executive summary and recommendations. I'd first like to talk about a, a group that had not had the opportunity to meet before our meeting in June, which was the concurrency mitigation group. Um, as we know, we've discussed this. The state for years had the concurrency trust fund, and that funded the campus development agreements. Now we still have the campus development agreement framework, but we don't have the funding. So this group was charged with the seemingly impossible task of saying, how do we fund campus development agreements in the absence of any funding? What do we do? We know that the cities and counties want the universities, and I think the universities want to be good neighbors and pay for the fair share of mitigation, but we don't have any extra money either. So I think the group has come up with some really good solid logical ways of dealing with this. It's not at no cost to the universities, but it's not at, I think we arrive at what is a fair share. So I think I'd like to ask Janet to maybe lead the discussion that we have a couple of pages in your package and sort of talk about the conversations and then if there's a sense of, a, you know, general consensus, we can take these back and incorporate some of these as recommendations for the task force. So Janet? Sure. Um, Scott and Linda, I just got here early, so please hop in. And also, we had some great um, input from the folks on the advisory group as well, so please, let's make this a joint conversation. But just to, to kind of paint the mm -hmm. overall theme, you know, we're operating under assumptions that we assume everyone else uh, is in agreement with, and that is there will be no more concurrency fee trust fund, nor, you know, funding for our off-campus impact. So, you know, now what do we do? And, and I think there was a recognition in our group that a lot of our construction is, is just so varied by project and that what we should do is maybe set up the greatest amount of flexibilities that we can within the structure because we build so many different types of things and so many different scales. Uh, we've got, you know, from University of Florida to New College in terms of, of what we're doing. So, <clears throat> so what if we had buckets, if you will, uh, that we would create within our new you know, process, whatever that is. And that would be that a recognition that there are certain things that just should be exempt that we shouldn't pay for. Um, <clears throat> and that may be a, a specific type of impact or fee. It also might be a particular type of building and its location on your campus that they really, we should just say, take off the table. This is not something that's going to create impact. Let's, we won't discuss it. Um, and then we should also create a bucket of negotiation powers uh, that, that really can talk about things like the cost per project, um, what is the impact, what have you already previously negotiated with your host local jurisdiction that may or may not have happened that's going to impact that. Um, but when you have this flexibility to negotiate, perhaps we could develop 
and agree on some statewide standards so that there's fairness in terms of what we're paying uh, around the state. And then there may be some types of projects that are huge that are going to have a significant impact um, and the ho local host jurisdiction and the university should go together to the legislature and say, you know, here, here are some costs to this, there, here are the benefits to the state, and we need a specific appropriation to help. Um, and so we wanted to kind of recognize, uh, without limiting any kind of situation that could happen that's for the good of the university and the ho local host jurisdiction while being fair. Um, and then the last thing we, we looked at then is the current structure that we have is built on assumptions that no longer exist. So what are the pros of, what are, what are the benefits of our current structure and what doesn't work anymore and how should we change it? Um, should we have an agreement? Should we not? How should we negotiate? So that, that kind of sets the framework. Any specifics? Um, a couple of thoughts, just to sort of put it in context of what we've been dealing with under the current system. As you know now, when we do a master plan, we, we do basically a 10-year horizon. You could do longer. Most of us do a 10-year horizon. And we put on that plan everything that we think we might build within the next 10 years. And um, many of those projects, because of funding realities, never happen. And so when we get our master plan approved after all the public hearings, we go to our host local government and we say, okay, here's our plan for the next 10 years. Let's agree upon some payment to you. To, to mitigate the impact of, of that entire plan. Um, and the county comes up with the numbers, and, and they're not pulled out of the air. They do use some, some standards uh, for, for traffic impacts and that kind of stuff. But, you know, uh, in general, we didn't worry too much about how much that was. They, they had to show us a methodology. We had this great fund that would pay for those impacts. In, in reality, what happened, though, is many of those projects were never built. Uh, the county got the full funding uh, for all the projects on the plan. And of course, there's no mechanism for a refund <laughs> back to the universities. And so, um, so, so really, it was, a, it was a, a flawed system to start with. Well, then add the fact that the fund no longer exists, and we don't have the internal funds at the university to, to deal with these uh, impact payments, and we have a real issue. So what we thought we would look at is rather than make us responsible for paying everything we might do, let's pay for the things we do do and those things that actually have an impact on the host local government. So uh, our proposal is first of all, develop standards that we all can agree on. And, and, and we had talked about that the host local government should be involved, very much involved in this process of developing what the standards are for determining impact. And as Janice said, that would vary by building. Housing should have virtually no impact. It's actually taking cars off the road. Parking garages have a big impact. They bring cars to campus. And so we would set up a standard, you know, for example, your, your impact fee would be X number of dollars per parking space or X number of dollars per square foot on an academic building. Everyone would know what that payment is in advance. And then when it came time to plan the building, you would know what that cost was, is and you could roll that into the funding for the project. So be, each project would be funded for concurrency at the time the project was planned. Also, we're, not paying, we're no longer paying for projects that we're not doing. Um, so we're paying for the real impacts, we're planning ahead so that we have the money to pay for them, and to us that seemed like a much more equitable solution. Linda, did you want to add anything? Um, I really don't have anything else to add. I believe that the um, committee met, and I think a, uh, the solutions actually work for large institutions as well as the smaller institutions. So um, I, I believe um, it's all been covered. And, can I? Yes, certainly. So, so Scott, let me ask a question. Um, <clears throat> that kind of uh, more, uh, if you will, realistic market-based uh, accountability, how would it work in the context of, or how have you thought about, let's say Campus X of one of the universities that's going to be hiring over uh, a period of time a lot of new faculty and staff, a certain percentage of whom would be likely to live in the, in the adjacent community mm -hmm. and add revenue and value to that community. Would you account for that at all in terms, of, uh, in terms of trying to figure out what the ad or number was? Well, that sort of gets to the, um, there's some sort of un, really hard to define impact of just growth that's not building specific. 
Um, I would argue that that sort of uh, uh, extra number could be put into the formula that you use for building so that you can capture what that is. I could also argue that the economic impact to the community of having the additional people, uh, the taxes that are raised by them buying houses and uh, that kind of stuff really pays for that impact anyway. And so- uh, That's my point. Yeah. yeah. From it's an economic course. development perspective, uh, the, our universities are, are agents of economic and social development. And so when we hire people, uh, particularly faculty, and bring them in, to me, that is the same kind of exercise as an economic development organization proclaiming the glories of uh, bringing in, relocating a new company with 20 new employees. Well, I like the thought, baby, we should be paid. <laughs> well, I, I'm just you know, saying that I, I mean, really, we, 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 if, if we were a, a private crap. company and we generate that kind of economic impact, we would be a, a, someone that, that local government would focus on and say, hey, that's great for the community. Absolutely. See, I don't, m m the point here is that I don't think we should discount at all the value that we bring to that location. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I believe yes. when, when the master plan was first developed and the campus development agreement, they, they highly recognized that for universities. And to develop, you know, the universities, the break we got then was we had to pay a fair share cost for the impact. So if they had to build a road of a million dollars and our share was only 10% of it, we could pay the $100,000 without the road being built. They recognized that we were different than Walmart. They recognized our impact. And I think as we go forward, we need to be careful in terms of equating a university to square foot or even just a parking space because our characteristics are very different. We may be doing those construction, not adding any more cars on campus. It may be for convenience of using our space more, you know, correctly. Square footage, I think our characteristics of FTE and headcount, those have more of an impact. So I think when we develop our standards, we need to keep, you know, an eye on those. And we have in the past. I think you'll find that most of the negotiations were based on that, not square footage. So I think you got to keep in mind FTE, headcount. I think you got to look at a, a real recognition of our impact to the university in terms of the economic development and we should get a, a, a discount, or whatever you'd call it, from say what a developer of a Walmart might get. So I think that we need to carry that forward. And I'd like to just say one last thing on what we've been calling vested rights. You know, we've negotiated these campus development agreements and a lot of the construction has not taken place. And I think we should be clear now that that vested or entitlement needs to be clear that we can transfer that to alternative projects that might not have been on the list or in the campus plan, but are now more critical to the university's mission. And we shouldn't be held up by the local government saying, no, that wasn't on your plan, you can't do that. You yep. can only build that ENG building. So I think it's important that we get to use that, you know, that money that we did pay. I think it's gotta be somehow we should be very specific that that entitlement or vesting, whatever you want to call it, is transferable to a university project that's alternatively, or has not been on the campus plan before, but now is critical to the mission. Because I think we're going to find that's going to happen a lot. And lastly, I would say some of the municipalities want to tie that vesting to the horizon of the plan. They'll say, well, your plan only goes out to 2016. You were vested to then. Everything's off the table past that. We got to make sure that that's not you know, in play either. We need to either say that, no, the, the, the rights that we paid the horizon's going to extend out. Now, maybe there's a differential that you can negotiate past that horizon date, but mm -hmm. I don't think that it should be your horizon was 2016, you paid for the 10 buildings, you didn't build them, we're not going to talk about that anymore. So I just think those are kind of specifics, but I think we should try to address them in the language so that when we all sit with the host local communities, because that's what we're depending on in the short term, I think, is this vesting and entitlement to move forward. Otherwise, you know, the other alternatives that are presented are great. I think, you know, each project might have to pay some costs. I think the exemptions are something worth looking at. So I think it's a good, a great start. I just think as we go forward, the better language we can craft that's clear, particularly on that uh, vested rights would be great. Yeah, I think, I think those are, uh, the, this group, Dr. Bentz, has done a really remarkable job. Mm -hmm. I think we've really they've been very smart about it because you know it's you know when you look at a campus development agreement it has so many different elements but they really boiled it down to you know what we've paid for has been transportation drainage and emergency services 99 percent of what we paid was for those particular things so then to dr rosenberg's point about the economic <laughs> development the bet what's the benefit you know, 
take drainage, for example. You know, one concept we spent a long time was talking about stormwater. You know, there might be, in many cases, no impact. If you can retain all the stormwater runoff on campus, you can negotiate and say, look, we will, re for this building X, we're going to build a holding pond. It's all on campus. There's no impact. There's, so there's no cost to the, or there's no impact. There's no cost. The cost is borne, you know, by the university right. to build the holding pond. On the other hand, if the university says, well, we could hold all the stormwater on campus, but that's really valuable land for future development. <coughs> We'd like to, if possible, have the stormwater go to, you know, off campus. Then you negotiate but it's very specific. So it's not sort of a, as it has been in the past, where it's more, we'll pay for the generic, you know, mitigation impact for stormwater runoff. It would be very specific that, you know, we're gonna build, there's a holding pond, there's some excess capacity in the local community. Let's negotiate what's a fair share for the university, knowing it has this great benefit to be able to use some of that stormwater capacity. And, you know, perhaps they jointly could build, you know, the pond but we wouldn't bear all the share of the cost. Mm -hmm. And so, and it wouldn't be, like Scott said, it wouldn't be for projects that we pay and they may or may not ever be built. It'd be clear that they're, they have to be built and it would be to the benefit of the university, the same with transportation. It wouldn't be just for generic road widening and road widening. It would be for a signal or an additional turn lane, right. something that clearly benefits the campus versus now. Like putting in it's a, a Walmart. Little, yeah. You know, yeah. you have to have so many turn lanes and so many traffic signals and right. you have to bear the cost. Yeah. Yeah. And we're a benefit, so we, we don't pay for the whole cost as a Walmart would. We pay for a reasonable right. proportion of it, subject to standards that it will be a set. Mm -hmm. I think this, this subgroup has done a great job outlining it. I'd like to, you know, of course, hear any other comments. Otherwise, I think we're ready to move on to the next item. Right. I, the, I heard a lot that we all did of, in Tallahassee about the pay-go, pay-as-you-go. People like that, you know, and I think so where that's going to resonate <coughs> in Tallahassee, uh, where you pay as you go instead of ahead or behind or whatever. You negotiate what it is, r roll it into your, build, uh, your project, and uh, that's when the money comes. Is paid. Yeah. Yes, I think we're at. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. I think we've got something that will now go into uh, the devil in the detail stage, right? And we'll pick it apart uh, uh, as uh, as Chris puts it together. You can't escape the pain. Uh, <laughs> totally. No, and I have I I have to say I really appreciate the, the the offering people like Debbie's right there in my line of vision. But you know, say you know. We're going to have to, somebody's going to have to draft all this and Jana into mm -hmm. actual, you know, statutory changes. And that is where the, oh, those strike throughs and underline and, mm -hmm. and, and Janice knows that that is really difficult. But I think if we can say we have a reasonable, logical approach, and that's what this seems to me. Well, that's where the rubber hits the road, too. We all know that. That's what we really need are strike throughs and add ins. Madam Chair, if I might, I just want to, and maybe Chris, you were hitting at this, and that is when the, it's the local municipality that wants to make some uh, revisions that might impact the university, that that's being considered as well. For example, as you know, we're talking about widening a road and redirecting traffic around FAMU, and so I think that, uh, you know, that might be part of our negotiation as well in this overall process. So it's not always us, universities having an impact, it's the <coughs> municipalities having an impact as well. Just wanted to put that out there for consideration. Okay. <coughs> um, I think that the other group that met, met over the summer was the charge five and six group, the specific projects group, and that was harder to, that was even harder, believe it or not, and we ended up with it sending out a survey to all the institutions to talk about that, and we got some good information for the, from the institutions, and that's in the back of the um, um, package with the task force report, but I think um, the thing to do then perhaps might be to defer that discussion until after we go through the entire report. So I think um, with that, that is pretty much our summer activities. And we now have, as a result of this, we have this draft report. 
and I think we are ready to have some discussion and mm -hmm. go through this. And Madam Chair, would you like to sort of um, um, take it from there? Well, sure. I think what we probably ought to do, uh, the pages aren't numbered, so bear with us. Um, uh, the first, uh, uh, let's go over it page by page. And uh, I think at the end of the day, what I would like to know is uh, you, uh, task force members and advisors, opinion on what we need to keep and what we need to not keep. We'll give you as much input as we can uh, on each of the elements. Uh, if we have information that's relevant. Uh, but I don't think we're going to throw anything absolutely in the garbage. We could. But uh, what we need to do now is to kind of sort. Which are the ones we think that we can get some traction on? Uh, which are the ones that, uh, that we think uh, need to go in the back? Now, when I say go in the back, I mean not immediate. There are things we need to work on this session, things that won't be good until the next session, ideas that won't be good until leadership changes two years from now, at least in the House. And so uh, keep that in mind also. So I guess you could say this is more of a prioritization of putting uh, um, ideas that we want to move forward in terms of the short term, the medium term, the long term. And some that are just bad ideas. It would be really nice if pigs could fly, but they're not going to. Uh, I don't think we have. Who knows? But um, that's what I think that we need to come uh, away from going over this report. Do you agree, Chris? Yeah, that, that is exactly what I was hoping we could do, that especially we can identify what's short, what, what do we think is possibly achievable in the upcoming session, and then what are others that are very good ideas? I, I'm with you. I don't think there's a bad idea left in the report. I think our previous discussions have sort of gone towards that mm -hmm. end. Now, obviously, if the task force feels strongly like, look, this not only doesn't need to be in the back of the report, this needs to just go away, go away certainly that I, we need to listen and as staff listen very carefully to what yeah. the members are saying. But I think most of them are either short term and more long term and maybe some are medium term, at least for the initial report. Of course, then it has to go to the board and the right. board may decide otherwise, but I don't think the board is looking. I'm looking over at Mr. Beard. I don't think they're I think they're looking for five or six, you know, several good recommendations, but I right now have 20 or 30 good recommendations. I don't think they want 20 or 30 and say, hey, they're all of equal weight, all mm -hmm. of equal merit, we all have an equal chance. I think they're looking for this group to kind of do some of that winnowing. Yeah, I think if we can find two to four ideas that we want to pursue now, uh, that would be a good thing. That way we can focus, we can target people, we can target committees, we can target support groups. Um, is that what you think, Governor Beard? Yeah, I think. A list that can be accomplished is what we want. Uh -huh. That's probably two to five, maybe. Right. It may be one, but two to five yeah, is yeah, a good right. right, right. So All we right. can focus on. Mm -hmm. And then it's important to put the other ideas in the back. I mean, I, I, we want next year's agenda, too. Right, <laughs> right. Okay, good. Well, the first couple pages yep. is. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I'll just send a smell. Something smells like it's burning. I don't know if it's burning. Else. Yeah. Can y'all smell this? It smells like something's burning. It's pretty strong. It is. Oh, okay. It's the coffee. Somebody's <laughs> ruining the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you got a good nose, Larry. Thanks. Got to be safe, man. We don't want to burn down this group. It's pretty strong. Uh, anyway, the, the, the first two pages are just definite uh, who we are, what the task force charges are and uh, what Governor uh, Scott's charge are. And so on page, uh, I guess you could call it four, uh, that has charge a strategic plan impact. Uh, this is where we really need to, does everyone agree that the mm, front materials is pretty cut and dry? Okay. Yes. Good. Um, now, um, the strategic plan impact. I think this is important to set the stage, Chris, and you might want to go into that a bit. Yeah, let me, let me explain this a little bit. Uh -huh. One of the things that's very important is that we tie whatever that we recommend back into the long-term strategic plan of the Board of Governors, which is a 2024-2025 strategic plan for growth in enrollment, growth in graduation, 
growth in um, grant funding as well and several other elements. And the question really is what facilities do we need to add? What facilities do we need to repurpose, remodel to meet those goals? I think it's very important that this group identify a dollar figure so that we can say in order to, you know, we know it's going to cost literally billions to reach those 2024 goals, but we're, we can't do it all at once. We have, and you can't, even if you had $3 billion, and that's not the number, but say you had that number, you couldn't build all those buildings in one year. It takes time, it takes, you can only put so many construction cranes on a campus at one time, but we have to have some realistic number. Dr. Bradley, I know, wasn't able to join us today, but he did a very good report. He did, you know, and sort of said, okay, here's the range, the historical range. And it was between two and 300 million. I took the FTE projections, did all kinds of calculus, and lo and behold, I was able to come up with roughly the same number that Dr. Bradley, being much smarter than I, came up with back in April. And it looks like the number is about 250 million a year for new renovations. Th that, that's the floor. Now, you know, more, I think there's always a good argument, and I've heard from many, the number should be more. And, it, and I can't argue with the more, but I think that's a floor number if we're to achieve the 2025 goals. But what that would allow us to do is something like this. Once it's established, then we get to other parts of the recommendations. We say, well, we could, you know, we need additional flexibility. We could use some deregulation. We can use other concepts. And somebody says, well, we'll sure, if, if they buy that argument. So what would you build? If we don't know what we're going to build, I think that undercuts our argument. And if we don't know, well, what is it total to? That also, we need everything to tie together. So we say, we need more flexibility. We need more flexibility so we can build these buildings or renovate these buildings. Here's exactly what we're going to do with the funding. And then not just for a one-year plan, but here's where we're going over the long haul. So it's not that it's so critical to arrive at an, an exact number, but we have to ultimately get there. If we just generically say, well, we need, you know, it's kind of squishy, I don't think that will work. So what this is, is our best efforts to identify a bottom line. On a, you know, this would be a year-to-year -year basis. And we could certainly discuss it, but I think, I think it's, for me as an accountant, it's very important to have some kind of bottom line number so I can tie everything together, if that makes sense. And I just wanted to clarify that when you say new projects, you, mean, you don't necessarily mean new construction building, you mean it could also be renovation of existing facilities. Yes, also renovation, certainly not just new because I know renovation is huge. I think I'm talking more from a new, from a funding perspective, that we need additional funding, funding, additional facilities funding for either repair, renovation, or possibly new. And I think that's the, the ballpark range of what we're um, looking for. Put that in a context, last year the system received $37 million for new and repairs and maintenance. So. To put another context, and I know I said this to the task force, and they know this, but just in case there's somebody new, you know, back in 2008, I think we got 800 or 900 million dollars. So some will say, see, this number is way high compared to last year. Some will see it as way low compared to what we got just a few years ago, and, and it's certainly now open for discussion. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, just recently, I was uh, listening to a, a board member discuss the challenges of uh, the PICO, and there was some question about the processes that led us to uh, identify how we uh, prioritized building of certain buildings, and that that may have been a, a flawed process. So I don't know that we want to get into that conversation here, but I think we need to be prepared to have that conversation, because and just listening to your narrative, um, I assume that that number is in part rooted in the historic processes that we've used to determine need and the reviews that have been carried out by, you know, the board and the prioritizations. And um, the context has changed. We have new prioritizations coming from the board. 
in the context of the plan and from the governor. So my, my point is only to say that I think we need to be sensitive to a, either a strong defense of that older the way that we did things to get where we needed to go or a willingness to reframe that process as well either you know in a short-term context or in a, in a medium-term context and I'm not too sure Chris that you know that's part of the mandate but I, I am, I'm listening to <coughs> what's being said by board members and uh, in other words it may be a good thing that we haven't had any PICO for a while because the process might have been, you know, probably gave us buildings that we shouldn't have been building. So I just want to make sure that we're prepared for that, Madam Chair. Okay. I will say that the sense, I've been told many times by members and staff, we don't need any more new buildings. State University system has enough. And so we will have to make that argument, yeah. President Rosenberg, yeah. we will. Yeah. The second bullet under recommendations about no net is increase to general classroom space at a system level is perhaps an attempt to understand uh, uh, that uh, issue, uh, but I don't know. Uh, what. Um, let, let's talk about that too, but I agree. We're going to have to defend. Yeah. Why do you need yeah. any more? Yeah, I, I, Use the ones you've got, yeah. graduate the students quicker, get them better jobs, get them through school. John. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure why that second bullet would even be there. Uh, some of the campuses, I mean, we've got facilities that date back to the 60s and 70s. And construction at that time has everything behind the block. So you literally have to tear things down to rebuild them. So th this becomes a cookie cutter approach where every campus is, has a different birth date that has different technology and different structure complexes, that this won't be one size fit all. So I don't even know why it would raise the issue to put everybody in a box. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it needs to be more selective. Because I, I can tell you now, we have buildings now, if I do a cost benefit analysis, it is not worth renovating it. By the time I pull it all down, I mean, I've got a building now that's gonna cost me $5 million to renovate. I can build a new one for 13, state-of-the-art, energy efficient, green building that would be the latest technology versus really taking an energy pig, resuiting it, and it still is never gonna be as good as what we could build now because it wasn't intended to be what it was in the 70s, what it is now in 2012. Can, may I address both of those? Of course. I think those are both excellent points and, and perhaps the no net increase, what I sh can explain, because I took out, like I said, some of the thought process that led to the conclu these conclusions and recommendations. When I calculated the 250, I actually took out the historic, you know, the need that would be generated from additional classroom space. What I, I, I took our current factors and I said, forget what we say we need, let's look at what we actually have on a per student basis and said, which is much less than what our formula calls for. I said, let's just assume that what we have now is enough. That's kind of a broad assumption, and I think in many cases we're like, you know, bursting at the seams and, you know, it's challenging, but somehow we're able to accommodate the students we currently have, maybe, albeit with a lot of difficulty. So I went with a very conservative number there. And I also said, you know what, I've heard so much from OPAGA and from various others. And OPAGA is, of course, doing a complete, you know, top to bottom review of all things facilities related. And I know they're doing it for higher education as well, from the college system as well. And I know they're gonna come in with, you know, more, you know, more utilization, you know, greater efficiencies. And so in this 250, the 250 has the assumption that there's no, classroom space. I just completely took that as a factor. So perhaps we don't need to say that. And again, that 250 is a very conservative number that I think will stand up to President Rosenberg's point to a lot of scrutiny because I've taken, you know, I've taken our enrollment projections. I've, I've discounted them somewhat. I've tried to make it as low a number as possible, but still be a realistic number so that the task force can have some comfort you know in that as well but in my backup that's not here 
there is no new classroom space. It's just, I just assume that we can somehow get by. Now, it doesn't mean we literally, as the second bullet says, well, no net increase. Maybe there is a net increase. It's just not included within the two the 250. I don't know if that helps answer or raises know. more questions. How can you build an academic building without classrooms? It would make I mean, no if sense. you built a college of business building, which we just did, you've got to have classrooms mm -hmm. in it. It's stupid not to have, I mean, just to build an office building or just to build a lab building. I know you can, but it's logical that in an academic building you would have classrooms. We all have a few buildings without classrooms, but they're few. Uh, so, um, yeah. Well, to the point, Chris, you know, and, and you know, you and I managed this, this, we and I managed the boom, so let me go back to my experience there. I mean, <clears throat> if I assume that you're thinking about the three year allocation cycle, when yes, you say yes. 250, okay. So the three year allocation cycle, we all know the strengths and the weaknesses of that. Um, but there will be many of our institutions who are going to come in with a hundred million dollar building. Right. And uh, that hundred million dollar building, truthfully, half of it might be able to be financeable through bonding up F&A, but it's not going to be because they can get the PICO and they'll take it or whatever, the, whatever it is going forward. But, but I think that, that part of the challenge, at least for the board, will be do we want to continue to do what we might be able to do the way we've always done it. And is that, right? is that the right way to do it? In other words, three years worth of allocation to get something built, uh, and so therefore we spread it around and we run the risk, of course, that the second and third year are, may or may not be there. And in this volatile you know, financial environment, I think it's much, the risk is much higher than in, in the good old days. So my point is, I just want to understand what are the assumptions behind that, uh, it, and and if we're going to only allocate 20 million on average to a building, that may be uh, penny wise and pound foolish, because we know that we're not going to get the same kind of uh, cycle of investments going forward as we've had in the past. So maybe it's better to build a bigger building all at once rather than space it out over three years. Yeah, I'll, I'll clarify that. It is meant to be 250 each year. So it'd be for over a three year cycle, it'd be 750. So you're assuming million. that you, we would still continue to fund over a three year phase in? Um, Were you thinking that? I, I actually wasn't thinking that okay. in this context because I was thinking over the long range. And I think that is a, certainly a discussion for this group and the board, but perhaps not to this. You know, this was just a general you know, number. It wasn't built from the bottom up project by project. It was based formulaically. What, you know, the three year funding model worked great for many years when there was a consistent, you know, when it was a predictable amount of funding. Now things seem more unpredictable. So perhaps, you know, you can build it. You can certainly finance and build a building if you know, say it's a hundred million dollar building. You can say, well, if I know I'm going to get a third, a third and a third, you can fund the building. Um, if, if, and if you don't know that it's going to be a third, a third, a third, maybe it's better to get all hundred million committed up front. But that's, you know, they're, they're two different things. Yes, Tom. Yeah, I, just to comment on a couple of things. Chris, I, you know, I appreciate how you struggle with the number, but if you look at our historical average, your 250 is pretty good. And if we can show, you know, historically that we've you know, tried to keep up and sustain and have not lost ground, I think that's something to go forward with when we're asking for additional funding. I think the three-year funding model over the last five or six years has kind of fallen apart anyways, where many projects are getting funding, planning, construction, equipment, all in the first year. And there's been a lot of different appropriations headed that way. But that's kind of specific to the project. I do agree that, you know, there may be a need to look at things more, you know, in a prioritization, you know, that is the bigger building what we need to do and, and less likely spread it evenly as the percentages were sought after each university. But I think it's important, even if we're getting bad projections on PICO, that, that we as a system continue to put together a priority system-wide list, the three-year PICO list. So we're, you know, we, don't, we get, don't get caught, you know, okay, where's your list? And well, we didn't put a list together because there's no PICO projections. I think we need to continue to do that. 
you know, we do have a lot of needs-based, you know, information, data, you know, from our 10 space categories, and there's always some flaw with that information. There's a guarantee. We we continue to say, should we look at that differently for research institutions? But, you know, it is something. So we have some information, like all systems, that could be tweaked. But I think it's critical that we continue to do that. And just comment on the classrooms. I, you know, I, that floored me, that statement. Just, you know, we're, that's our business, you know. and. And what we're experiencing at FAU is, you know, you're trying to do more with less, which means for us, we need to build larger classrooms. We do not have that. That has not been our model in the past. So it's one of our highest priorities is to build a large classroom so we can teach some of the undergraduate classes in a bigger forum, which, you know, as we all know, is our financing or our funding of the students goes more to the student tuition. That's important as part of our growth model. So I think, you know, that notion, you know, I'm striking through mine with a big black pen right now. <laughs> right, I got mine never circle. on any of our paperwork. But I, I so, so John, I, I guess the modernization of an existing space to another, you know, maybe that's where someone could argue, well, you're not going to have a net increase. You're going to take five small classes and build one big one. It's not a net. But you still may need the five. You still then need the big one. So I, I just. Well, and you that, may take a two-story building and go four. Right. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. I mean, and they take yeah, it down and grow. That, yeah, and that's an example of using our property more economically and, and going vertical. So, yeah, that, that notion, Chris, I understood you did it. You just took it out of the space group, right? You said, I'm not going to add that because you thought the square foot cost was getting past your 250 comfort level. So you said, I'm going to take off classrooms. I'm assuming that's what you did. Yes, and I'm just very sensitive to what Dr. Bent said. You know, there's this perception that there's no need for classroom space. I can't tell you how often I've heard it. So it's refreshing. This group gets it, but you know, and I'm very, this, it's the group, the task force, if they want to strike this, it's gone. Well, we can be silent yeah. on yes. it. Yes. You know, we don't have to say we need more, or we don't need any more. We can be silent on it. Uh, so I think that's one approach. John and then Debbie. Madam Chair, I, uh, we all know this, it's not just about the quantity of classroom space, it's the appropriateness and quality of that space. Teaching is changing yes. in every discipline in higher education, and it's about flexibility. Uh, in the health sciences, one day a classroom needs to replicate an operating room, the next day it wants to op replicate a, a hospital room, the next day it needs to be a 50-person classroom. Right. That's, that's how teaching spaces are used today. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not the physical plant that for the most part exists on the ground. So the argument needs to be put forth that it's not about quantity necessarily, it's the quality and usefulness of what's there. Right, with the uh, lecturing, uh, sort of the, the, the lecture format is decreasing a bit and the guidance kind of format and students working in small groups is and that, that, that's changing too, so I, I see your point. And that can be said. Flexibility in, in classrooms. In business, in architecture, in psychology, you can go across the board and make that argument. Mm -hmm. Debbie? My only point was um, on perception. Clearly as part of this report. Pardon me? Oh. My, my point's on perception. Um, I think you made a really good point. We need, clearly we need in this report to help change perceptions because we have to convey realities, not receptions, of what, uh, perceptions of what everybody's dealing with. And I don't want to feed into existing opinions. Right. I, I don't think that's the purpose of this Which committee. Which no new classrooms would, would, yeah. would buy and into I, that. And I'm not there. Right. Maybe, you know, maybe we could give application data. As the demand is there, the money's not. Well, in the strategic plan, there is a figure for how many students we as a system, you, the board as a system, expects 10 years from now, what is it, 350,000 more or something? So 50 or 60 percent increase. Right. And that alone begs the question of no new class. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, so I you don't even need to wait for the applications, Janet. <laughs> I think it should be tied back to the strategic plans of each university. And if we approve those plans and they've got classrooms in right. it, then obviously it's already there. I mean, if we've agreed to that. But that begs the question. We got to get got to get very very specific about what buildings are coming on mm -hmm. in the next 15 years. Right. That's a different question than whether we do or do not need classrooms. So let's strike this. Lisa, Lisa, sorry. Okay. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to mention that part of it too with with the Paga is 
when you look at our utilization of classroom space, it's really hard to, I mean, to, we're not using our spaces 100% of the time, and classrooms and labs are what they focus on. And then the other piece of the, the puzzle is the, the distance learning and that everybody's really pushing for, you know, that's where the, the future is, is distance learning, in which case you're not in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. so. uh, Matt, Judy. Yes. So, uh, and this really is probably directed to, to Governor Beard. I mean, clearly, if, if the board were to say that we have to uh, double down on utilization and you expect classes to be held 18 hours a day, six days a week, and that, you know, you could do that. And then that would have an impact, you know, then that might, you know, have a bearing on that we expect no net utilization. But in the absence of that kind of guidance, mm -hmm. and in the context of wanting each university to figure it out based upon their board approved mission, then it does leave, uh, then it does leave a lot more leeway for trying to address that issue, which is ultimately probably best. But if there were policy guidance that went in that direction, then I think we'd be in a much better position to say, okay, this is what we got to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, I, this is just my view, but each university in the system is very, very different, very different ages, very different everywhere. And I think the board has got to dig down and, and figure out what each university needs based on their strategic planning. And, and we've got to say, okay, we don't think you should have any more. Mm -hmm. Classrooms because you got enough based mm -hmm. on a pog or whatever. But if you take the whole system as a the average, you're going to get to the wrong conclusions in a couple, a lot of cases. So I'm I'm tied back to the strategic plan. Uh, I just think that if, if I agree. that ties to our plan, then we've got something we can all get our hands Yeah. So that's a, that's, that's that sounds like that's good. So we'll strike the second <laughs> bullet from or, this. Or say subject to the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, well, the board should adopt a policy on general classroom space that ties to the board strategic plan. That's All right. right. The university strategic plan. All right. Okay. To the okay. The board should adopt a policy. I mean, I'm not going to word smith. About classroom space. At the that ties to you uh, just rough notes ties to the university strategic plan that's accepted by the board. Anyway. Said in uh, real English. Like Matt, you look puzzled. No, that's you all right. Yeah, I, I like I like I like that. Uh huh. Rather than just striking it. And yeah, being because silent. Uh, yeah, well, because many of the universities are extremely different. I know FIU, a good example. They're they're teaching at all hours and they're at a hundred and fifty percent capacity with the classrooms and uh, they need to have the ability as as do many of us to, to grow with population increase and student enrollment increase you can only teach so many hours um, and students won't go yeah. so uh, I, I I like the idea of tying it to the individual right. university um, Board missions and strategic plans. Strategic yeah. plan. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And I, if the strategic I, plan is to grow, that's fine. If it's I, not, I, I actually get that concept now. That you what, and that would <laughs> that would help with Opaga because right now it's like, oh, there's a statutory standard. Well, in general, we're as a system, I can say we're over the statutory standard, we're, or in all the schools are either over the standard or close to meeting the standard. It's a 40-hour week standard. We're already there, but what the Board of Governors has never done is say, well. What should the goal be for in each, each university, each college is different because they have different missions and to say, you know, what is your goal? Otherwise, I think each institution is kind of in the, well, you're doing 60%. Okay, well, what are you going to do next year? You know, there's always this perception that you got whatever you are, wherever you're at, it can be better and more utilization is always better to the point where you, as Dr. Rosenberg said, it's six days a week, 18 hours a day. and I would say that's probably not the best use of university resources where every classroom and every building is run all day long and I guess the you know the janitorial staff come in in those six hours off yeah, and right. clean it's just not feasible and not a good story but I think by setting those targets as part of the strategic plan that would set a benchmark and then Opaga could say well the board set a benchmark if it's a reasonable benchmark are you meeting the benchmark or not and maybe you're if you're over in utilization, then that certainly would 
be a good argument that to add classroom space, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I, I got it. I, I, I'll say it one more time and I'll be quiet, but I, I'll, I respectfully disagree again with, with having any reference to classroom space. I mean, if it's in the strategic plan, as Governor Beard said, then it's already there. But I, I guess I'm more uh, iterative in approaches and th there's two muscle movements in that, those lines. One is just to be able to secure a number that's, that's defendable, $250 million for replacement, modification, refurbishment. That, that's one part. Then, then two becomes classroom space. And, you know, once we can get the 250 codified, then maybe it becomes a time then to put boundaries around the 250. But what if that 250 turns into 150 and now we've bound ourselves or 100 or pick a number, whatever yeah, number you yeah. want, and you've, you've established an artificial boundary before you actually have a number. Now you've got to back into it. And then we're going to have to come back and say, we need another policy change. So I, I, when you have absolutes, it gets very difficult to come back. And this, for me, becomes almost an absolute no new space. Or If it's in the strategic plan, then those, those presidents and those boards are tasked with their mission. They just need to be held accountable mm -hmm. to what the power they've, and authority they've already got without lumping another restriction on top of it and just hold them accountable. All right. I think there'll be an opportunity. Oh, I, I was going to say, I think there's going to be an opportunity for some wordsmithing so we don't have to get too much in the weeds for you today. And then you can respond back to that wordsmithing back to Chris in such a way that... Well, you, let me get a sense of in or out. We want to be silent on classroom space or do you want to wordsmith classroom space? How many people want classroom, uh, any reference to classrooms, space, out of our document? Out? Out. Yeah, Don't why, talk why, about why it. One, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, everybody. All right. It's out. It's out. out. It's out. It's out. Sorry. Okay. We'll strike it. We can always put it back in. All right. Good. Silent. Silence is golden. All right, now we go to concurrency, and we've talked about that. Yes. Right, so we can check that off. Now we need to go to uh, charges C, D, and E, which are funding options. And uh, review other state support, all sources of current potential university facility funding, current revenues by 101062, and determine the public-private partnership alternatives. And so we've gone down, we've taken those, and have some recommendations. You want to walk us through these, Chris? Sure. And if I may, maybe we can take them sort of in um, chunks so that we don't mm -hmm. have to talk about the you whole bet. page. So the first one is under um, recommendations with regards to other state funding models. And we have three bullets. Um, the first bullet would be creation of a dedicated authority for public higher education similar to the current Florida Higher Educational Finance Authority that's available to the not-for-profits in private schools that's created by, by law. And other states have, in many cases, as well. So again, you know, universities can issue debt directly. They can issue um, through the state. And of course, as a system, we've issued state bonds, PICO bonds being the most familiar. But this year, we did lottery bonds for higher ed facilities. But there's not a middle tier. There's not a, a financing authority in the state of Florida for the universities. Um, and Matt looks like he has a question, so I'll stop. Uh, we, we say in this first bu bullet, uh, creation of a dedicated authority. What about the ability to use the existing one? Um, currently, the universities are not allowed by law to use the existing one. Now, we can certainly <coughs> discuss, should we be under allowed to be under the auspices of the Higher Educational Finance Authority and go that route. I think there's two considerations there. One is the higher educate the authority can only grant, you know, it, it can't create new sources of revenue. It can only approve what's allowed by law. Most of the bonds that are done via this this conduit are you know revenue bonds, tuition revenue bonds, or gen and that's what's allowed to the private and not-for-profits because they're private and not-for-profit. So that's what they're used to doing. So if we came to them under our you know with what our current limitations 
and just said, just let's add the universities into it, I think they would, the, the Higher Educational Finance Authority would have some difficulty with that. You know, it would be, a, it would be different than what they're used to doing. Um, and they don't do that much, do they? Um, I mean, it's significant. I mean, they typically will do a couple hundred million a year, and that's just off the top of my head, because we're talking about all the ICUF schools, and I think some others are allowed to use them as well, and they've also, you know, they've been doing this for many years, and it's a good model. The other, I guess, is more of a policy consideration. Do the state universities want to go to a conduit that really is focused on um, not state institutions, you know, currently, you know, or do we want our own that sort of has a, uh, a public institution, you know, speciality? And so those are really the considerations when we discuss this item. Okay. Um, the, the next two items are, uni one recommendation is university debt should no longer be considered state debt by division of bond finance as part of their debt affordability report. And what that means is that, as was discussed earlier, currently um, certain university debt, especially the CITF debt, is considered state debt. The housing bonds are not, parking bonds are not, but the student fees are because the fee, it's, it's imposed by law, it's considered a tax. Therefore, it's tax and it's considered actually direct debt of the state. It doesn't meet a lot of the kind of, which sounds intuitively kind of wrong to me, because we think about compared to say a PICO. PICO is a tax, a tax on everyone because everyone uses electricity. Uh, this is a very narrow tax. It's, only, it's really a user fee. It's on students and it supports student facilities in this case. It doesn't meet the general char characteristics of state debt or we think about, um, no. Toll roads are generally considered not direct debt, they're, they're revenue, they're, self, they're considered self-supporting. I would argue the CITF projects are self-supporting, but right now, because the way, thing, you know, the, the def, way things are defined, it's defined as state debt. So I think this point, this, the point of this bullet is to say, let's look at the definitions, let's look at this for what it really is. The, the CITF, the student fees, are not a general tax. It's a user fee, it's self-supporting it's self debt. It really shouldn't be considered state debt in terms of it's not a general obligation of the state. You can't, you know, the only way if there was ever a need to increase revenues, the only way to increase the revenue is to increase the fee. So it's, it's, it's really a very narrow pledge, but it's treated as if, you know, it's the same as PICO or lottery, or state road bonds, which I think are very different. And then last, the last bullet is universities should be authorized to issue debt on parity with existing debt. We are, of course, able to issue debt on parity with existing debt, but we have to use the existing you know, issuer. And I think this bullet, and I'd be glad if somebody jumps in when we talk about it, I think this bullet is getting more to the, if a university wanted to issue parity debt, but not use the same issuer. In this case, mostly the state, if it wanted just to have issue pure parity debt without having to go through bond finance and have the state name, but have it still be legally parity debt. And I think that came from um, one of the advisors, but that's the concept. So those are briefly what these bullets are about. Mm -hmm. Well, which <laughs> one do you, ones do you want to keep? Two. <laughs> Number two? That would be sweet, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is number one feasible? The first bullet. Well, I, I guess the question, though, is, I mean, I'm trying to get the mantra of that acronym ROI. So what does this dedicated authority, is that at a current resources is this a new agency is it going to money it's going to cost a million dollars to set up an agency to do what i'm i'm a little worried about bureaucracy so i don't i don't quite understand is this is a new entity it's a, already an entity with a new charge it's no, it's cost neutral or because if i'm sitting at the legislature then you're going to give me programs but you're giving me a bill with the programs i'm not so sure i'm interested 
let me let me weigh in on that if I may. Uh huh. Please. Um, the current this this higher educational finance authority it's currently set up as a fee based structure. So if you bring a deal to them, you're going to have to pay a percentage. Currently, of course, for the Board of Governors review, that's that's free. It just costs you time, but it doesn't. We don't charge a fee. And whatever actual issuer you choose, if you state bond finance, of course, they're going to have a bond finance fee. If you issue it yourself, you're going to have your own cost. If you use a, you know, a local conduit, you're going to have to pay a fee. So you can't, it will be funded by the fee you pay to basically, you know, they'll just be a new conduit. So it doesn't really increase your cost, but it would be a new entity and it will be fee based. What's the advantage? Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the advantage as I see it, and I, I'm, I'm neutral on this idea, the advantage as I see it is that you would have a dedicated authority that specializes in higher education. Um, the Division of Bond Finance does not specialize. That is just one program mm -hmm. of many programs. They do state road bonds, they do PICO bonds, they do lottery bonds, they look at the CAT fund. They do all things debt and debt related for the state. Universities are just one component, whereas this would be, you know, a dedicated authority. And same with board staff. You know, I do other things besides bond issues. I love to do them. They're fun. But, you know, this would be a dedicated group. Well, Chris, do, saying that, is that just, aren't we still going to have to be reviewed by bond finance for I mean, there are sections of law where, in order for us to even bond anything, we have to get approval. This, this would be a significant change in law. How this would be structured, I think, would be, there would be a lot of strike throughs and a lot of underlines. I don't think we'd want to lose the ability to go through bond finance or to issue on our own. So in order to allow us this just as an option, yeah, I think it's possible, but I think it would be an, take an extensive rewrite. Okay. That, I'm just trying to figure if it's worth it. Yeah, yeah right. right. No. Could this that, be that's on all I'm trying to figure. Two-year plan, like we we begin to talk about it this year and, and examine it and more. examine the law and talk to the legislators and their staffs uh, about uh, what it would take and be able to begin to work on it. And if it blows up, it blows up. If it moves, it moves. So I'd like to, sure, if sure. we're going to create a, a new entity or a new authority, I, I'd rather it be if it's going to really focus on higher ed than to be broader than just this and I'm going to jump ahead a page but the public privates and the P3s and you know, I mentioned at one of the meetings before we don't do enough of it that right. we're that good at it but you get better believe developers are <laughs> so we need an entity that can really uh, specialize in that so that every university doesn't go out on their own and try to think they've cut a great deal and and we all know there's there's right. examples that are great and there's examples that are disasters so I, I don't I don't disagree with the concept but I would like it a broader concept to be a, a warehouse of higher ed specialty actions vice what's out there now then and this would be a component along with you know dedicated public private folks that work the deal but just not to have a, an isolated silo. Well, why don't we put this on hold then? For year two or three. Right, right. Is that okay? Right, and it, we may roll it into P3s when we get there today, uh, but let's keep it alive, uh, but not uh, pushed up on our, uh, our priority, because it's complicated and something else may take care of it. All right, now the second bullet. Um, yes. University debt's no longer state debt. Did this? Uh, did you touch upon that issue with Ben Watkins? Because this was a huge uh, risk element, uh, I think, for 101062 that drove 101062. That in the end, uh, if the university defaulted, um, uh, that the bondholders are going to look to the state. I mean, his, his view was there was no bright line, even though legally, you know, we could argue that there was, and uh -huh. that. So I d was that an issue that you had the opportunity to discuss with him or not? Matt, would you like to address that for us? Yeah, uh, we, we talked about it uh, briefly, and I think the creditors in the bond, people that buy the bonds, whatever, are going to always look to the state and in the end as a backstop. But if we could get it out of it that it's legally state debt and, and get that concept that 
it would help us uh, able to, at least when we talk to legislature and the governor, um, have better insight into. And I think Ben Ben Watkins does recognize that the underwriters will always look to the state and that there is some uh, credit there that will reduce the state's capacity. But I think we can still try to get it out of the legal definition. You think he was okay with that? And I think he was okay with Support that. With, yeah. To redefine it and kind of ease the direct connection. Hmm. Are you talk, you're talking about the seven and six percent caps? Yeah, and I, I'm not yeah. talk I'm not talking right. about the Ben would still put it in his report. Yes. It would be it's like the cap fund. It's just out of the seven and six percent yes. cap. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Bill, you want to no, say no, something? I, I was gonna uh, no. Okay. All right. Well that will help. Mm -hmm. Leave it in. And uh, Watkins was supportive of it. Well, as Ben it. always says, he you know he doesn't create policy; he just enforces it. But he says that a lot. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> right. So, Madam Chair, what's, hey, what's ben, 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 this is Mark Weinberg. I just want to jump in on that real quick, if you yeah. don't mind. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, the different debt that the university issues is in the legal document, the the resolution, the indenture. However, the document is set up with the bondholders. It is set up differently, but in the offering statement, it typically says that if you're looking at housing, if you're looking at parking, um, obviously PICO is not, but it says this is not the rec debt of the state of Florida. Um, so there is no legal, um, there is no legal ramification. You know, the division is absolutely right. You could argue that there is a moral obligation, but there is no legal obligation. And I think, you know, leaving number two in is very good, but to be honest with you, you might need number one to truly diversify and get that truly out from under um, the state's cap. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about that later. Okay, Bill? I, I was going to say earlier, too, that, that in all of our offering statements, it all, it, the, in all of our offering statements, the point is always made that this is not state debt. And the uh, rating agencies that rate right? it understanding it's not state debt. And I'm not aware of any precedents where this moral obligation has ever been fulfilled. Oh, no. Yeah, Never. there's. No, you're you're absolutely right, Bill. But I, I think this goes to if we, if when we get to some of these points on the next page about um, allowing us to issue, getting rid of the functional relationship, allowing us to to issue some type of limited general obligation bonds that may include tuition, is where I think this is very important because if we did uh, bond some portion of tuition, that may be considered legally state debt under the way it's currently written. The way it's currently written. Can I jump in here real quick? This is Tony Baselli. Sure, Tony. Uh, just to follow up on what Mark had said, uh, not only in the offering documents on the bonds, but one of the things we talked about last uh, session and made a little bit of progress with Ben, but he, he continued to say the same line. He says to everyone else, I don't set policy, I just enforce it, which is an interesting line, but anyways, is that you can structure not, I mean, bonds is just one mechanism or one means of, uh, of, of debt. I mean, we talked about uh, long-term leases where uh, the lease would be written in a term where there'd be no recourse back to the state. That was the only time Ben even started li uh, listening. And so not only would you not be bonding tuition, which some people might say is a gray area, gray area but it would simply be it would, it would simply be a lease. Back, the the university would just be signing a long term lease with whatever entity built the building and leased it back to them. And even at the end of that term, with the university uh, uh, having uh, uh, being transferred the facility, and that lease would be would not be considered state debt. There would be no recourse back to the state, and even uh, mm -hmm. there would not be a direct bonding of any tuition or anything else. There would be a general obligation of the, of the university to pay the lease, but it would not be looking to any one revenue stream, and there would be no one, any revenue stream even mentioned within the lease. Right. It would only be shown in the business plan that would be part of the negotiations. Right. It would just be, a, it would just be like you know, any, uh, any entity going to a, either a, 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 a private developer or whoever, or even just the financing, you actually can still do the development process the same way if you wanted to uh, as a university and just find a private financier that, that we will 
we will fund this project and lease it back to you over this term or this lease rate uh, and at the end of the term you have it back and it would just be whatever university signing on the lease uh, making a, 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 an obligation and a promise to pay the lease on a, on a whatever the terms are set at. Right. Right. And the, and the, and the financiers would, be, would not be looking uh, to the state. They would understand that the only recourse they have is the university and they'd be looking to the university's credit. I think if we can get it in, we should. Yes, you know, I agree. But, right. And, 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 we, and, I, and I did, last, I mean, I worked on this last year with the help of Chris uh, and Janice, we were talking to Ben, and that was the only, I, where I finally got Ben to say, listen, I will, I'm not excited about it, but I'm not going to kill it. Yeah. And that's the way we have to be, you know, we just want to make sure, that, I mean, we, if Ben starts going against mm -hmm. anything, we're mm -hmm. in a lot of That's trouble. right. Yeah. That's right. Right. Thank you, Tony. What about yep. the uh, third bullet under this topic? University should be authorized to issue debt on parity with existing debt. You want to keep it in? Yes. And heads are nodding. Anybody shaking their head no? All right. So we have three bullets here. Uh, dedicated authority. Uh, university debt should not be state debt, and universities should be authorized to issue debt on parity. Uh, want to keep all these in? I, th I thought you were doing the first one in year two. No? Down the, road. the authority. Yeah, we said it down the road, long term. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I forgot. Down the road. So two and three. Yeah. The second and third bullet we're going to keep in, high priority, working hard on them. And the third, we're going to keep uh, the pulse. All right, good. Good. All right, now let's move to current and potential revenues. I think these we've discussed a good bit. One thing I'll mm -hmm. say, I inadvertently sort of switched formats. The three that are in bold redirect revenues from current sources to mm -hmm. enhance PICO, non tobacco settlement, corporate income tax, and capital improvement fee, those are the, actually the three recommendations under consideration not each of the bullets so i've switched format on the group ah, and i apologize ah, so, so I there's wonder. less there's less work than apparently we have to do so i and i think we've talked about the revenue redirect on pico we've talked about the non-tobacco settlement fees at our last meeting the corporate income tax deduction for sus facilities and this this last one has been <laughs> added late capital improvement fee i'll give that just a brief explanation one of the things, of course, we all know last session the universities were allowed for the first time in over 20 years to increase the capital improvement fee up to $2. Most universities took advantage of that um, flexibility provided, brought it to the board in June. The board approved those increases for the universities as requested. And historically from there, it would have been a matter of estimating bond capacity, looking at cash projections, and coming up with a number to include in the LBR. And the first time that anybody would have seen that would be at tomorrow's facilities meeting. However, we're in a different era, and getting that capacity number, bond capacity number, has been somewhat problematic. The challenge there is you know, making sure at the end of that process of the LBR legislative approval, that the State Board of Administration will authorize those bonds. Mm -hmm. I know last year for the college system, they of course have a similar program. There was some initial um, reluctance to approve the bonds, and then at the end of the day, some bonds were approved, but it was for a lesser amount. Do I have that right, Lisa? Yes. So I think the concern I've heard expressed is, let's make sure before we get everyone excited that we can have, you know, we estimate originally 140 million. Before we get excited and think we have this money for next year, if it's appropriated, let's make sure that the bonds are going to be let, that at least before we even start the process. And that's really what, so this is not asking for new legislation, but sort of asking for gubernatorial and legislative approval, at least in concept, to say, hey, we'll consider this, and if it goes through the legislative process and the project isn't vetoed, that at the end of the day, the bonds will be let. There's no question the revenues are there. It's right. such a conservative program, um, and we have great double A credit, and it's you know at least a one three cover. 
everything's good. I had originally assumed, hey, that one doesn't need to be on here because it's a no-brainer. But I put it back on here now because we're running into, it's not as much as a no-brainer as it originally thought. Mm -hmm. but so those, that's, that's for the first bullet. That's for the first bullet. So those are the first, the, the revenue redirect is just the tax shift. We've seen that um, in the past few years, the tax shift to Pico Idea. Um, the non-tobacco settlement, I think we all understand what that is the, uh, on the manufacturer fees, and there's a bill introduced last session, and the corporate income tax deduction for SGS facilities. We've talked about that a yeah, bit. Right. So I'll, I'll be glad to take questions, but I think these are ready for a discussion. Okay. Anybody uh, interested in knocking anything off, has high blood pressure over one of these, want to keep them on? Governor Baird, you good with those? I'll find them. Okay. Michael. I did have a question about the Pine Floor. We can go to the University Facility for next, Chris. That doesn't have the end of the page. Under capital improvement fee, the second bullet. Next page. Oh, I'm very sorry, Michael. I, I completely right. missed that. <coughs> this was another <laughs> idea that came up um, a after our June board meeting that, you know, you know, the the current CITF has always been dedicated for student facilities and I think the concept is you know we can go up to 10 percent now and we don't you know that would be for you know current law current process which is a student fee committee and the fee has to be recommended by committee the college system can go up to 20 percent they don't have any student fee committee but the concept here would be that there should be that amount between that 10 per up to 10 percent that the students have direct input on there'd be there'd be another you know up to 10 percent between 10 and 20 percent that could be used for other university needs perhaps not student facilities perhaps renovation or other things and this would parallel what the state college has they can do it on a full 20 percent well, this would only say you know on, on, on a t between 10 and 20 percent half of that yeah 